I'm Indy Nidell, and this is a World War II special episode. The tank, as you may have noticed from our regular episodes, played a prominent role in the Second World War. And one tank that played a major role early in the war was the Soviet T-26. Now, today's special is done in association with the Tank Museum Bovington, and its curator, David Willey, along with David Fletcher, are now going to tell you the story of the T-26. Now, during the First World War, um, when the Tsar's army collapses and the Red Army is formed with the Soviet, the Communist Revolution, one of the key words there is that word revolution. The Communists were absolutely adamant they were going to have a brand new army made up of brand new people, not have an evolution from the Tsar's army. And uh, that idea, however noble for the communists at the time, just didn't really work. They found they had to bring back in Tsarist officers and training methods to really try and help this new Red Army actually be an effective fighting force. One of those officers that was moves over from the Tsarist army into the new Red Army uh, becomes very influential in the 20s and 30s. His name is Mikhail Tukhachevsky. And what happens is he ends up manoeuvring himself into a position where in the 1920s, he argues a case saying the Red Army really ought to be at the forefront of mechanization. Um, two big schools of debate develop in Russia in the 20s, one of which is, should Russia use its massive country and its huge number of people to fight wars in the future um, that might be called attritional wars. In other words, use your resources that way. Um, Mikhail ends up saying a completely different way of looking at it. He says, no, we should actually go for wars of annihilation. Stalin finally wins and comes to power in 1929 and he backs this new idea of the Red Army being fully mechanized. And uh, what ends up happening is um, Mikhail comes up with this idea of let's try and think through how we might fight that war with this new mechanized force. And he's looking at the idea that with industrialization in the 1930s, he had hopes that the Russian economy might well be able to build up to about 50,000 tanks 8,000 aeroplanes, and it is going to be at the forefront of a modern mechanical army and be able to use that. Now, that sounds fine in theory, but what actually happens, of course, in Russia, like so many of these wonderful idealistic projects, it all falls apart along the lines of actually building a tank is not that easy. So after the First World War, they've only got a certain number of Renault FT tanks, some captured British Mark V, some Whippets. But by 1930, where Stalin's now in control, he sends out a purchase commission that starts going around the world, comes to Britain, and that's when the Russians actually come and they buy examples of the British export tank from Vickers, what we now know as the Vickers export or six ton tank. Um, a guy called Ginsberg is in charge of that purchasing commission. He ends up bringing some of those tanks in 1930 straight back to the Soviet Union. And they also buy the plans to build those factories or those tanks in Russian, new Russian factories. And as the 1930s progress, the Russians get better at this. And the arguments within the Russian military, how are they going to fight this war? They swing back and forward. 1935, they've got about half a million men in the uh, Russian military. By 1939, they're up to 5.5 million soldiers in that Red Army. So you can see how they are going for this mass uh, forward-looking Soviet military. These tanks are supposed to be rugged. They're supposed to be go uh, uh, in combined arms, go with paratroopers, go with aircraft. Um, they've looked at what other Western nations are doing. They're learning from this as well, as well as coming up with their own version of mechanized warfare. The T-26 and all of its sort of family, if you like, emanate from the British six-tonner, the Vickers Armstrong Marquis, of the one we're looking at, the uh, 1933 model, they built about 5,000 of them. 
which is typical of the Russians to build them in huge numbers. But that's how this tank looks from the outside. From the turret downwards, at least from there downwards, it looks like a six tonner. It's got the same sort of four cylinder air cooled engine driving into a five speed transmission at the front, front drive sprockets, and a typical Vickers Armstrong's suspension. But the real secret of the T26 is what goes on above that level. They put in a new turret and they added a 45 millimeter gun, which gave it a much more powerful anti-tank potential than anything that uh, Vickers had produced. And it was actually quite a good tank in its day. Now, by 1939, Stalin has got paranoid and started, he's doing these purges on Soviet intelligentsia, and he also goes for the military. And some of these great names from earlier in the 20s and early 30s become victims of his purges. In 38, um, Tukhachevsky is actually shot by Stalin's agents. He ends up losing um, about 35,000 of the Russian officer class. Um, some are sent to Siberia, to the work camps. Many, including many senior figures, are actually shot because of this paranoia Stalin has that they might revolt against him. Uh, and that leaves this massive new Red Army with equipment that's coming into service, new operational art, really almost leaderless. And that's reflected and we can see how some of those problems um, end up affecting the Red Army when they go into Finland in the Winter War of late 39, early 1940. Now, part of the Finnish plan is they actually go to Britain and they order 32 um, Vickers export tanks, this famous six-tonner tank, the same tank that is the basis for the Russian T-26 tank. Now, for various reasons, these tanks have not actually arrived in time. They only start arriving in 1939. Now, Finland, again, because of currency issues, they've only ordered these tanks in their barest forms. They don't actually have radios, they don't have armaments. The, the idea behind that is the Finns are gonna fit Bofors anti-tank guns uh, as opposed to the original Type B Vickers export tank um, that would have either a, a short-barreled uh, British-made gun that would fit in that turret. Now these guns that Finland hoped to fit, they have problems ordering those, they have problems fitting them, so by the time the war actually starts, Finland basically doesn't really have an effective tank force. It's got some earlier Renault tanks, but these have been used for training and are pretty much redundant. Um, and that's about it. They have these Vickers export tanks, but they are pushing to get them ready in time. So hopefully they'll be ready for some fighting. Now the Soviet Union, um, as we've discussed earlier, they've got thousands of tanks ready. Lots of these T-26s even if they're not all in perfect working order. And as we've discussed earlier, the T-26s, some of them, their build standard is not that good. Now the Russians put in early mass tank and infantry attacks, and these are decimated by the Finnish defenders. Quite often, even though it's supposed to be a combined arms battle, the Russian forces, the Red Army, doesn't fight effectively together. So we have situations where the T-26 tanks are advancing, the infantry that's supposed to be supporting them loses contact. What the Finns do when they draw those Russians onto the Mannerheim line, they try to draw the Russian attacks into areas they know they can fight back. So for example, their tank barriers may have a gap in where that's where they'll put the mines, hoping the T-26 drivers will drive in that direction, seeing a way through. Some of the T-26s, when they attack in these mass attacks, they become isolated. And that's where the Finns, again, they come into their own because they descend on the tanks and they've got things such as Molotov cocktails. These teams of Finnish soldiers would stalk an isolated T-26 tank. They've got gaps in the armor where they're jointed and some of the welds are not actually that well sealed. And on the rear of the T-26, 
one of the engine air intakes vents, um, that you could almost get a whole Molotov cocktail through that, and that would set fire to the engine. And when the tanks failed, often they were followed by human wave attacks, literally hundreds of Russian Soviet Red Army conscripts marching across the ice, uh, and they were being mown down by Finnish machine gun fire. So early battles seemed to go the way for the Finns. Stalin realizes his own frontline forces are not doing well, so he sacks a commander in chief, he reinforces them. So by the following February, there are a huge number, nearly coming on for half a million Russians, are ready to attack. Uh, and in February, the pressure of their attack leads to the Finns ending up suing for peace. And something called the Treaty of Moscow is signed in uh, March of 1940, which brings an end to that phase of the fighting. The Finns have managed to get a number of their Vickers E tanks into action just towards the end of the fighting. Again, for the Finns, because of the terrain, because of the lack of training um, and the, the, the lack of simple experience in using armor, they are not successful either. Um, and they lose a fair number. But what Finland has got is a huge number of T-26 Russian tanks that they then take back, either repair, put back together, help put together some of their Vickers E-tanks. They actually use guns off of some of the captured T-26s. And so they actually build up a bigger tank force after this fighting is over from captured weapons. And this particular T-26 I'm leaning against was actually captured off the Russians in the first instance. It was then used as a static vehicle, almost like a pillbox by the Finnish military um, later on in the war. Another theater of operations that the T-26 saw service in that's not often talked about is China. China is a country that after the fall of the Qing dynasty, um, it's basically broken up into a series of territories run by warlords. And it's actually one of the warlords that first introduces tanks to China. He actually buys some uh, Renault FT tanks off the French. Um, but an, in an effort to unify China, the Nationalist Party, initially led by Sun Yat-sen and then later by Ka uh, Chiang Kai-shek, what he does is he tries to uh, get tanks to help support his military force. Now, Chiang Kai-shek ends up involving Chinese communists into uh, this nationalist movement. And because the communists are there, Soviet Russia is happy to send military advisors to help Kang Chiang Kai-shek. So we first of all got Russian military advice going on. That then changes when the communists are expelled from the Chinese Nationalist Party. And the next minute, it's German advisors turning up, giving advice to the Chinese nationalists. And what these German advisors do is suggest that they buy some, first of all, some Panzer I and Panzer II tanks off of Germany. They buy some Carden Lloyd carriers off of Britain. And they also buy some of the famous, here we go again, the Vickers six-ton export tanks. And they're actually sent out to China where they see action uh, again as part of this nationalist force trying to reunify the whole country. The Japanese in 1938 sign a treaty with the Nazis, and basically the Japanese say to the Nazi party, look, you've got advisors helping the Chinese, we are trying to invade China, can you send them home? So these Nazi or German advisors are sent back to Germany, and Russia sees another opportunity of sending its own advisors, who then also orders Russian tanks. Hence, we start seeing these T-26, 82 of them, are actually ordered from the Russians by now the Chinese Nationalist Party. And these tanks are, in essence, a bit of a match for tanks like the Type 95 Hargo tank that the uh, Japanese are coming the other way. The Soviets send engineer, military advisors, and the Chinese Nationalists set up a new unit that's called the 200th Division. And within that unit, there's the 82 T-26 tanks are used, 
uh, along with quite a number of other armoured vehicles, some they've captured, some that have been imported, a real variety. Now that armoured force actually has some initial success against the Japanese, but after the Japanese sign a non-aggression pact with the Soviets, that Soviet support for these tanks, the training of the Nationalist Army, disappears. And this is where the Western Allies then step in, because we, by now, um, as in the Western Allies, America and Britain, are now at war with Japan. So American equipment starts taking over. So in within literally a decade or so, we've seen uh, initially British, French vehicles, then Russian vehicles, and then it's American vehicles are supplying uh, the Chinese Nationalist Army. But it was another one of those areas where the T-26 tank did see some action, and it's a, a series of battles that are quite often forgotten about or overlooked. Once again, this was a collaboration between World War II and the Tank Museum Bovington, and subscribe to both our channel and the Tank Museum's own channel. And please support us on Patreon, because your financial support allows us to do collaborations like this. If you would like to see more about the T-26, you can click right here for David Fletcher's Tank Talk. If you'd like to see The Chieftain, who did a collaboration with us about British tank doctrine in the 20s and 30s, you can click right here for that. See you next time.